that you're joining us for this uh, celebration a day early of uh, Women's Day, International Women's Day. I teach on Thursday nights, so that's kind of why we're doing it today. Anyway, uh, we've been so lucky to get cooperation from some of the best organizations in Wichita and Kansas that work and fight for women's issues. And uh, we have expertise from the Department of Women's Studies here at WSU with us. So I'll be introducing them later, uh, but we have, just for your information, Dr. Doris Chang, who's Associate Professor here at WSU, and we have Carrie Ann Rinker, who is the eminent uh, lobbyist for Kansas Now. And I am Ranford Tilla. I'm co-chair uh, co of Wichita DSA. And I also actually teach a class here at, uh, in, in Women's Studies and Religion. That's my view. <laughs> so what I'm planning to do is to kind of take us a little bit back to the roots of International Women's Day as a kind of educational uh, experience. And that through that we'll also be looking at and celebrating some of the main activists. And then we will move on to uh, the other two speakers. We plan to leave plenty of time for discussion, comment, and questions. So, uh, most people in our contemporary society kind of take for granted that many of the things have always been pretty much the same as now. And today, we're going to be reminded of how the measure of equality that women in our society today do enjoy is only a very recent phenomenon. And that if we don't guard and continuously claim these rights, they will very quickly be eroded. In fact, options and possibilities that our mothers and grandmothers fought to achieve are now under serious threat in a fundamental way. And there have been two main fronts, uh, if we go back to sort of the origins for the, women, the modern women's rights movement. There have been two main fronts along which they've been uh, fought, and I've put up sort of two examples of here. We have Mother Jones, and we have the suffra suffragettes. So it's, it was sort of the an, uh, upper middle class and eventually professional women, and the other one led by women workers, that together form the basis for our struggle. Just a very quick refresher about the, uh, the 19th century. During the 1840s to 90s, the laws giving married women economic independence and the right to control their earnings were passed in uh, most states in the U.S. and Europe and a few Latin American and Asian countries. And more and more professions that have been closed to women were opened up. So examples of this are laws giving women the right to education, something that we don't really think about today. Uh, laws concerning inheritance, laws giving married women independent legal status, and laws allowing women to divorce and get child custody and various forms of combinations of, of these things. And at the end of the 19th century, the acceleration of industrialization and World War I make up a really significant context for a new consciousness among women workers from this time on. And it, it is the American and European socialist movements that form the background for the birth of International Women's Day. On March 8th, in 1908, 15,000 garment workers in New York City, including many immigrants, ma marched through the city to man shorter hours, better pay, and voting rights. One of the organizers behind this movement was Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a labor leader, activist, and feminist who played a leading role in the industrial workers of the world, and a very important movement uh, up until post-World War I period. Flynn was also a founding member of the American Civil Rights Liberties Union, the ACLU, and a visible proponent of women's rights, birth control, and women's suffrage, and her career lasted through World War II. Uh, she is probably the inspiration for Joe Hill's song, The Rebel Girl, and this is a quote from her that I thought uh, was something that was good for us to be reminded of today. History has a long-range perspective. It ultimately passes stern judgment on tyrants and vindicates those who fought, suffered, were imprisoned, and died for human freedom against political oppression and economic slavery. In Europe, um, wait, just another comment first. The textile and garment industry 
which mostly was made up of women workers, was a, a focal point during this time of strikes and demands in the following years. And beginning in 1909, the Socialist Party of America declared the first National Women's Day. Not international, but national. And it was observed on February 28th. Women continued to celebrate this day on the last Sunday of February until 1913. So that was kind of like a precursor of International Women's Day. And in Europe, uh, the international, the second Socialist International Conference was preceded by a women's conference, Conference of Working Women in Copenhagen. This was in 1910. At this meeting, Clara Zetkin, who was a leader of the women's office for the Social Democratic Party in Germany, tabled the idea of the International Women's Day. The same day it was to be held, that was her idea, the same day in every country, so that there would be one day that it could kind of be loud enough for people to, to hear. Um, the same day, uh, and, and there were over 100 women here from 17 different countries, representing unions, socialist parties, working women's clubs, and so on. They, it was approved unanimously. And uh, just a little few words about this woman, Clara Zetkin. This is her together with her uh, co-worker, uh, Rosa Luxemburg. She uh, was educated as a teacher, and her mother was also educated. But she developed ties to the women's movement and the labor movement, and had joined the German Socialist Workers Party, which later became the SPD in Germany, the Social Democratic Party. But at that time, which we're talking about the, the 18, late 1870s, socialism was outlawed in Germany, and she went to Paris. And there she was important to the uh, forming and shaping of the Socialist International. She did develop later a social democratic women's movement in Germany and was uh, the editor of a German newspaper called Die Gleichheit, which means equality, from 1891 to 1917. As I said, one of her main allies was Rosa Luxemburg. And together, they uh, started to form a faction of the party that was anti-war, the SPD. It was an anti-war faction that were leading up into, into World War I. And they broke with the party because the party did support the war effort. And uh, they started, it was kind of like a revolution, they started what was called the Spartacus League. And later, uh, the German Communist Party sort of evolved out of that movement. And she joined it and represented it in the German Reichstag, the parliament, from 1920 to 1933 when it was outlawed by Hitler. And Rosa Luxemburg, uh, her co-worker, was, was killed during the post-war uprisings in Germany in 1919. And of course, she's become this icon for the far left in Germany since that time. But what I want to emphasize is that the anti-war uh, stance was very important for the history of the International Women's Day. So back again to 1911, 1910, 1911. After following this decision in, in Copenhagen, International Women's Day was celebrated uh, every year. And the, in the first year, over a million people attended rallies for women's rights to work, vote, be trained, hold public office, and end discrimination around the world. And after, only after a week of that first celebration, there was a big fire in a garment factory in New York City that killed 146 young women, often, even children, workers, most of them recent immigrants. And this massacre became important to later uh, celebrations of International Women's Day and also became an impetus for the demand for safety regulations, as we can imagine. Now, <clears throat> just uh, at the same time, you know, in Russia, all kinds of other things are going on that we can't go into because we don't have time, but there was a strike that started the uh, or or they, they started to observe Women's Day on the last Sunday of February, 1913. And uh, then there were discussions and March 8th was finally decided on. In 1914, um, further women's rallies and campaigns to end the war and express women's solidarity were held all around the world. This is a poster for the Women's Day in, in Germany in 1914, 8th of March. And that became the day that this was uh, celebrated. There were some, uh, with, with the Russians, there was some coinciding with the calendars that had to be done because they followed a different calendar. But finally, March 8th was, was decided on. Also, uh, Russian women held a strike for the, what they called for what they called bread and peace. 
uh, in response to the death of over two million Russian soldiers in the war. And they striked, and the Tsar abdicated, and after that, the women were actually also granted the right to vote. So these are some, to summarize a little bit about the main issues behind International Women's Day. Workers' rights, women's rights that were political, economic, and social. The socialist or social democratic agenda and the anti-war stance. Um, but along another axis, which I mentioned at the beginning, there were uh, the struggle for political rights was happening both in Europe and in America. So I want to look a little bit at that too. Um, and uh, in England, there is the famous Emmeline Pankhurst, who, this is actually a picture of her holding a speech in Connecticut, in Hartford, Connecticut, in, in, in the U.S. She was chosen as one of few women uh, by Time magazine in 1999, you know, on this list of most important women in the century. And this is the quote that is from Time magazine about her. But uh, she's famous, and uh, her movement started because she married a lawyer who was supportive of women's rights. I mean, she started before that. She was introduced, her parents were politically active as well. She's from Manchester, another important textile town. So kind of these things tie together a little bit. Um, she founded the Women's Social and Political Union in 1898, after her husband died. She, he was a lot older than her. And uh, they, they, her main slogan was, deeds, not words. And they became quite militant, and actually even started to use arson as a technique. This kind of got out of hand, and she had a break with her, her daughters, uh, two of them, whereas one of them stayed with her to support her. One of her famous daughters is, is um, Sylvia Pankhurst, who was a figure in herself, but we, we don't have time for her. If I have more time afterwards of the discussion, I'll tell you about how I met the, grand, her, the grandson of um, Emily Pankhurst in Ethiopia. But anyway, uh, I just want to point out a couple things about her speech, this one that the photograph is from, because there it shows the, the connections between England and America. And she, uh, her, in her speech, which is quite long, but she re understands her situation as one of, that she is a soldier in a civil war. That's how she sees herself. And that's how she justifies uh, the way, her, her methods. She says that, um, I am here as a person who, according to the laws, law courts of my country, it has been decided, is of no value to the community at all. And I am a judge because of my life to be a dangerous person. Then she also goes on to say that she's very glad to remind American audiences that two of the first women that came to the conclusion that they would not submit to unjust imprisonment any longer were two American girls who are doing some of the most splendid suffrage work in America today up in Washington. I think they are making things extremely lively for the politicians up there. And I don't know whether every American woman knows what those two women, working in conjunction with others, are doing for the enfranchisement of American women at this moment. I'm always proud to think that Miss Lucy Burns and Miss Alice Paul served their suffrage apprenticeship in the militant ranks in England. And she goes on to talk about how they had uh, been uh, participating in an action in London in front of the parliament, gotten arrested, and had st staged a kind of uh, revolt in the prison, refusing to wear the clothes, starting hunger strikes, and some of those methods we know from um, the ironclad, uh, no, what do they call again? Iron clawed angels movie, for example. I'm sure some job. job, yeah, iron job <laughs> angels. So I, I thought I had a photo here also of, uh, but I must have missed out the photo of uh, Lucy Burns and Alice Paul together. But uh, this is uh, an example of the work that was done through uh, the National Women's Party that was founded by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns in 1917. And it uh, replaced or took over for the what they had been called the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, changing tactics a little bit. Instead of lobbying individual states, uh, fighting for a constitutional amendment that would guarantee women's rights, the uh, right to vote. And it was really World War I that provided the push for women's suffrage in America. And it was when Woodrow Wilson announced World War I as a war for democracy and that they needed to, that the U.S. needed to enter the war to save the democracy, that was the chance that was used. And the National Women's Party was the first cause that picketed the White House. 
they, their slogan was, we women of America tell you that America is not a democracy. 20 million women are denied the right to vote. President Wilson is the chief opponent of their national enfranchisement. And then they, they're calling him here Kaiser Wilson, which of course is a play on Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany, who, they're, who is their enemy. Um, and comparing the plight of women in America to the plight of the German people. Many were arrested. And Alice Paul uh, was, as we know, sentenced uh, to a, a prison term of seven months. She started a hunger strike, experienced forced feeding, and all these things that, that really we don't want to think about uh, happens in, or happen in U.S. prisons. Wilson did change his position in 1918, and uh, it was kind of like a war, as a war measure. So he, he managed to wiggle himself uh, out of the situation, and the Congress did pass the 19th Amendment in 1919. So, um, oh, here they are. That's Alice Paul. Yes, it yeah, is. and that's that that's the victory, and this is the this is Lucy Burns in prison. Okay, I just have it in the wrong order. <laughs> This is a, a, a map I'm not going to dwell on, but uh, if we have time later, I'll go to show you the state of uh, women's suffrage in the U.S. Act prior to the 19th Amendment. Because many states did have a vote, all the green states. Including Kansas. Yes, <laughs> including Kansas. So, I was going to talk a little bit about Kansas. And uh, these are, are some women who, on the national level, much earlier were fighting for women's suffrage. In the summer of 1865, uh, Republicans proposed the 14th Amendment that would be uh, give the, the newly freed 2 million black men the vote. And this was the first time that the word male was put into uh, the Constitution. And women were now explicitly not guaranteed the right to vote. So this was something that had been assumed, in a way, if you read the letter of the law. And this led to several efforts by feminists to combine the abolitionist and suffragist movements. So the idea of an Equal Rights Association uh, was proposed by Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony. Now, I'm trying to... This, the, the one with the, the, this is actually a type of photograph that is one of the early techniques called a daguerreotype. People are interested in photography. She's wearing pants, do you see that? That was a fashion that she introduced, the uh, pantalons. And that is Lucy Stone. The, two, the, the one sitting down is uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the one standing up is Susan B. Anthony on the other picture. And these three women, they were sort of like a triumvirate for women's suffrage in the last half of the 19th century. They, they prepared the way, and they also worked, they lobbied actually in Kansas for this. And uh, unfortunately, in similar ways as uh, these efforts failed at the national level, it was because it pitted two causes against each other. The, uh, the, the black vote and the women's uh, vote. And unfortunately, politicking, you know, as we know, that's the, the worst kind of th situation for any kind of fairness and, and solidarity can often be uh, the thing that, that kind of is the, uh, the price. It's the cost of, of uh, politics. But anyway, uh, in Kansas, as we saw, the, the women's vote was passed a little earlier, and it did finally, for the, when it was raised for the third time, it was in 1911 to 12 that there was a, a referendum. And finally, women were secured the right to vote in Kansas as the eighth state that allowed it. So we were up, we were up front that time. Um, let's see, I feel like I'm taking a little bit more time than I wanted to, but I wanted to mention three other Kansas, uh, now, this, it was hard to find photographs of everybody, so there's somebody here who I'm not going to talk about. But these are three Kansas women I wanted to mention that, that Stuart helped me uh, research. Stuart Elliott, my co-chair uh, of DSA. And the first one, uh, this one on the, on the left, is Kate Richards O'Hare. She was an American Social, Socialist Party activist and editor. And she was imprisoned during World War I. Um, she was convicted of espionage um, because she had given an anti-war speech in North Dakota. And, and this, at that time there were no federal prisons for women and she, uh, she was put into a federal state penitentiary but was pardoned one year later by President Warren Harding. 
after a big campaign for her release. She also ran for uh, Congress in Kansas on the socialist ticket in 1910. So that's when the Socialist Party is kind of at it, when, you know, it, it, it's uh, its best time. But unfortunately, she didn't make it. So then on the other picture is uh, a picture of Edda Semple, one of the two. Now I don't remember anymore. <laughs> I don't know if anybody recognizes them. The one on the left. The one on the left. Thank you, Stuart. So she is a very interesting character. She came from Illinois originally, but she's best known for promoting free thought and feminism. She opposed racial bigotry, capital punishment, and so-called blue laws. They're laws that, uh, were, that kind of enforce uh, religious standards, such as having no commerce on Sundays and things like that. And one of the most interesting things she did was that she uh, put out an ad one time in a paper that she uh, also edited that said, a reward for $1,000 will be given to the man, woman, or child who will furnish positive proof of a God, the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ as a Savior, the soul, the devil, heaven, or hell, or the truth of the Bible. <laughs> but nobody, uh, nobody came to uh, offer their proof. So, but she did create a lot of controversy, and apparently uh, there was an assassination attempt on her, but somebody else was targeted. And uh, authorities believe she was the intended victim. So that's a, a fairly interesting character. Um, finally, I could not find a picture that was uh, not copyrighted of Carolyn Lowe, who uh, was originally from Canada, but grew up in Iowa and lived in Kansas City, Missouri, and then later she became a, a lawyer here in Kansas. She's best known for her defense of labor leaders and immigrant workers from the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, who are uh, picked up in mass arrests at the beginning of World War I. And uh, she traveled around and defended them also here in Wichita um, in the 19, in, in, so in the around 1917. Then she later became a lawyer for the United Mine Workers in Southeast Kansas. Now for more on Kansas uh, women activists, I recommend this book that some of you have written in, I know, who are here. Um, Radiating Like a Stone, Wichita Women and the 1970s Feminist Movement. An excellent collection with amazingly a lot of material available at um, your local bookstore. Um, what's it called again? Watermark. 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 I was about to say Walgreens. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> Dorothy Billings is in there. Yeah. <laughs> so so is there. Mary Heron, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just a few. Now, I wanted to say I spent some attention on the roots of our modern uh, women's movement. Individuals and movements have taken the struggle worldwide. And I just want to show you a few iconic faces uh, of women activists from the last few years. So we've got one of my uh, heroes, Joan Baez, at the top there. And then there's, uh, there's Coretta Scott King and Gloria Steinem. We have uh, Vangari Matai of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya involving women in environmental protection. And that also gave economic independence. She won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. On the, on the left. Yeah, Magari Matai, she's And then there's Rigoberta Bichu, who also won the Nobel Peace Prize back in 1992, and who has fought for uh, uh, indigenous people's rights in Guatemala, and also she was recommended by women's organizations, or uh, nominated. There's Shirin Ibadi, a lawyer from Iran, the first Muslim woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the picture of her I wanted. I wanted to, to show off that I've been to her house because I had a picture of me with her. But it was back home in uh, Norway where in my parents' house and they were out and couldn't scan it and send it. So <laughs> Anyway, then there is uh, Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and former high, UN High Commissioner of Human Rights. She passed laws when, during her term as president. First of all, she reinvigorated an office that had been basically dead. And uh, she passed laws decriminalizing homosexuality and laws giving access to contraceptives. We're talking about Ireland here. And a general, also an important thing, a sort of general age of consent for all that didn't discriminate between uh, you know, different, um, uh, different um, what's the word I'm looking for? Genders? Yeah, or, or identifications, you know, different ways of, uh, yeah, gender identification. Um, these are the three uh, winners of last year's Nobel Peace Prize. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, uh, Liberia and Lehman Gbowi of Liberia, and Tawakol Carmen from Yemen. 
And what I just want to end with is that every day a new struggle is won. For example, last October, Kenya passed a law uh, banning female genital mutilation. And even just today, there was uh, a, an idea to set up a global green, front, green fund for women in developing countries was put forward by this Norwegian uh, women's rights group called Focus with a K, supported by and supported by uh, Mary Robinson, who now has a foundation for climate, um, you know, uh, climate justice, she calls it, and which focuses on the third world and a way to get women involved in, in processes of decision making. And now it's going to the the Rio Plus 20 Economic Summit in July to, to get funding. So this might be a big thing. I don't know. We just, it's at the beginning of it. And so just to close with saying that the women I've mentioned today are iconic ones. They're leaders. But ultimately, the struggle for freedom and independence is fought by each individual woman, often together. So, so many women make a huge impact every day without getting any kind of recognition. Here's one uh, example of women from the Coalition of Labor Union Women here in the U.S. In my own experience, nothing has given me more inspiration than more faith in society, like when I'm about to give up and say, well, there's nothing we can do. But nothing has given me more hope than meeting women in countries I've been to and worked with women groups, Palestine, Kosovo, Bosnia, Lebanon, Cambodia, and others, and here in America, too. These women, against unbelievable odds, are fighting to claim their democratic and political but actually mostly social and economic rights. And sometimes I wonder if political leaders can get us anywhere, but I know for sure and that if, if through anything I do, any girl feels less alone or any woman realizes that she has the capability to stand up for herself, then that work is never wasted. And investment in women is always safe, is what I say. So, I want to finally also warn against becoming complacent ever and thinking that we have what we need because we, we can never rest. I mean, <clears throat> uh, it's clear from the negative developments that are happening here and it's clear from anywhere else I've been where if you stop paying attention and start to relax, it, it re the process gets reversed and I think we'll hear some examples of that. So I want to stop. Um, since evidence